All right, Mayor, you're good to go. Good afternoon. I'm Mayor Jim Langfelder, City of Springfield. It's Wednesday, March 24th. We appreciate you joining us for this Facebook Live. Special guest today is Brad Cole, the Executive Director for the Illinois Municipal League. Appreciate him joining us. And I'll go through a few items first, then do a formal introduction, and we'll go from there. But uh, the main focus with regards to the coronavirus has been vaccinations. Uh, the state of Illinois, I think they've been um, really uh, shown the leadership role under Governor Pritzker and really making the vaccinations happen, especially in Springfield uh, with the Illinois National Guard and how they've partnered with the Sangamon County Public Health Department. And I'm sure with our medical community, with second to none, in my opinion, but out the fairgrounds is a great site to have that done. And actually, Governor Pritzker, to my surprise, he's actually getting his first vaccination today. I think he was doing that about 1130. Uh, so um, I'm sure, you know, about four weeks later, he'll get the second dose. But I thought he would have already had that. But I'm glad he uh, waited for the protocol of government workers. Uh, we're free to get those taken now. I know I haven't had mine as of yet, or Brad Cole hasn't as of yet, but mine's scheduled for tomorrow uh, through St. John's uh, Hospital, and we'll make that happen. Uh, but uh, just on the vaccination front, I think 25% of individuals in Sangamon County have received two doses, which is a great number, but even better is the 65% that's received the first vaccination. And so uh, one point I will make is regardless of uh, what your feelings are towards it, you should get the vaccination, whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson. The Johnson & Johnson's a one-shot vaccine. Um, I know uh, with my family, we have people in the hospitals, we have people in education, and uh, they've received each varied, one's got J&J, &J, one's got Pfizer, and one's Moderna. And so uh, they're moving that direction. So I encourage you all to get your vaccine uh, whatever that is. And to do so, the easiest way is to go to our website, springfield.il.us. We have a rotating banner up at the top. And on that is the uh, locator for, um, you. all you do is click on it. It says, uh, it'll connect you up to the state of Illinois website. And on there, it has the location. You just enter your zip code. It'll show you all the various locations that you can go to get your vaccination. The other thing uh, we do have where you can actually set up your appointment through that same link. And so again, go to springfield.il.us in the rotating banner, and it shows uh, those two particular links that you'd be able to have access uh, very easily through your, your internet. The other thing, of course, we need to continue to wear our mask uh, correctly over your nose and mouth, but that's going to happen regardless if you've been vaccinated or not. We encourage you to be uh, wear your mask. It's still um, a law in Springfield. Uh, so it helps keep the infection rates down. It helps to make sure that we can keep our businesses going. And uh, hopefully, eventually, we'll reach that herd immunity, which is 70% of the people receiving their vaccination. Up until that time, though, the mask will be required and moving that direction. The other thing, uh, the governor did make a change. We're going from Phase four to phase five. Phase five is where we're opened again with the herd immunity, but there's a bridge in between where they are allowing access or greater access to people that are attending events. It's uh, typically 25% of the event capacity. If it's an indoor event like volleyball, uh, it depends what that gym can hold. And it, again, you have to have the social distancing guidelines in place and then the wearing of the mask while you're in public or at a football game, I went to Springfield and uh, Lampier this week, and um, uh, everybody was distant, but they do have that greater capacity. The one thing when they're counting is if you bring your card for vaccination, uh, then you will not be counted towards that number. So it's important to keep your card on you, especially if you're traveling or anything. I think it's going to be one of those credentials that's going to be needed in the future, showing that you've been vaccinated. Or if you're going into an event, they won't count you towards that official capacity so others can enjoy uh, the activity going on. The other item, uh, if you had taken a uh, um, co coronavirus test three days prior to the event, you can take your, and you have your negative test uh, result, you can take that information with you, and that way it won't count towards the capacity as well. So those are the two ways we can get into events, uh, either with your vaccination card or if you've had a test 
three days prior showing that you are uh, negative with the coronavirus, uh, that won't, you'll be able to get in one, but the other thing is uh, won't count towards the capacity limit. So more people can enjoy the event that you're participating in. So we're slowly getting to where we wanna be, but again, wear your mask while you're out in public, uh, have good hygiene, washing your hands is like our mothers always taught us when we were growing up as much as possible, and then uh, keep our social distance. Um, so those are the helpful hints for today on the coronavirus, but it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Brad Cole. Brad Cole is the, has the great distinction of serving as a mayor at one point in time if, uh, in Carbondale, and then uh, became the executive director for the Illinois Municipal League. And that is our um, lobbying or representative group that represents all the cities within the state of Illinois at the Capitol here in the state. And so whenever there's a uh, initiative that comes up or if it's a state budget, if they're looking to uh, decrease any um, payouts to the cities with our uh, local government distributive fund, where we receive funds from the state of Illinois, or if they're going to uh, you know, have other types of legislation that does impact the cities, uh, Brad's group and Brad himself are in those discussions and making sure that the cities are protected as much as possible. And I call him uh, Illinois City's greatest chief advocate for our municipality. So we can't thank him enough for what he's done. And especially during the pandemic, he's put out information on a regular basis. Uh, they've always kept their doors open so they could support the cities uh, so we could provide the services to our public, regardless of where we live. And uh, we can't thank you enough for the great job you've done, Brad, uh, during this pandemic and continue to do as we mo move uh, post-pandemic. So, Brad, if, uh, I don't know if I've left anything out uh, with regards to uh, your introduction, uh, but if you would share with us, I did ask you beforehand if you received your vaccine or not, if you'd uh, give that update as well. Sure, and thank you, Mayor, for the invitation to be here and for the kind introduction. The Illinois Municipal League is here to serve all the cities of Illinois, all 1,298. And our staff has been proud that we have been here every day throughout the pandemic to be able to provide resources to members like you and other local officials. So uh, we feel like we've been providing valuable service and it's refreshing to hear that you and others think so too. Uh, I have not received my vaccination yet. I will get one in the next couple of weeks. I am kind of in the middle of the age bracket, so I don't qualify uh, for being old enough. This is maybe one time when people actually want to be older so they can get in sooner, but uh, I believe I'll be getting one here in the next few weeks when the Illinois guidelines open up for everyone to be eligible after April 12th. And just to your comment about the vaccinations, the state as of yesterday had provided about 4.8 million doses of the vaccine have been administered. It's about 91,000 a day now is the average. So they, uh, they are working quickly around the state, it's locations like you indicated out at the uh, state fairgrounds here in uh, Springfield, but at other designated locations as well. And I would say that uh, Springfield and you, Mayor, have been a leader on this to try to make sure people get vaccinated, that the information is available, the locations, the sites. There have been a couple of special pop-up locations. Uh, just a few weekends ago, there was one over at the Good Samaritan, uh, or a, the, uh, I'm sorry, it was at the uh, Salvation Army. And mm -hmm. so uh, kudos to the city of Springfield for the work that they've been doing under your leadership with that. Well, thank you very much. And uh, just a sidebar to the Salvation Army, that used to be the Gold's Gym. And uh, originally, uh, they were going to be located about uh, 20 feet from the railroad tracks. And we put them in the position where they would move to that facility. And uh, one time it was supposed to be a shelter, but uh, I talked to them and they uh, really wanted to help the community and what our needs were. And uh, we that he opened up the community center. So now they're partnered with SIU, I think, and others. Walgreens came in at that time, provided the vaccines, as well as uh, they have a food pantry set up. So they're really taking on the task to ch stop the proliferation of homelessness as much as possible. And then they're also helping with the uh, other facility on 11th Street where they do provide homeless services. So we can't thank Salvation Army enough for doing that. But the interesting tidbit is that's where I first met Alderman Gregory. 
And that was before he was an alderman. And he came in, he took a tour of the facility. And, you know, he had an open mind at that time. And, uh, you know, that was unique. Uh, and then he's always served in the uh, at, you know, the pleasure of the council as, as far as Ward 3 in that representative mode as far as uh, keeping an open mind. Uh, because, you know, it, it it we all have our interest with regards to our uh, areas that we represent. But it does get to be a challenge when you're trying to do the right thing. And that does uh, go against the grain, so to speak, with the individuals that you're representing. They may not understand the situation. And it's up to us sometimes to take those hard decisions like uh, wearing your mask or shutting places down. And it's uh, not that we want to, but it's uh, that we feel that's the best interest of the city. So if you could speak to a little bit about uh, where things are throughout the state on you know, opening things up. I know some cities probably move ahead faster than what they should, and others uh, probably, uh, you know, are following, of course, the governor's guidelines. But if you could give an assessment of how things look statewide, um, that'd be helpful. Absolutely. And in all sincerity, Springfield has been a leader in trying to provide for what local government's job is. The, the job of local officials is to provide for the health, safety, and welfare of their residents. And so while you've made some of those tough decisions, uh, such as uh, a mask ordinance and some of the restrictions on business, that's all been to provide for the health, safety, and welfare of the residents and visitors of your community. And we have seen some disparity in the application of those tools around the state. As you know, the governor did announce that we will be moving from phase four to phase five uh, with a transition or a bridge period in between there. Uh, once we reach a certain level of vaccination among adults, uh, that 28-day bridge period should coincide pretty closely with the month of April, which means as we are nearing the end of March and vaccinations increase, more things will be opening up in about a week or 10 days. Uh, we have had a number of communities around the state that just ignored the uh, rules, the executive orders the governor issued, and they had spiked cases and they had impacts that I think they didn't predict. Uh, some didn't have any problems, uh, mainly because they were in very small rural areas. But uh, then the majority of communities did follow the executive orders. That was our advice to make sure that there wasn't any additional liability that would be placed on either the communities, uh, government or their residents. And so uh, most communities did comply with the executive orders. It's hard to affect human nature and sometimes that's what it comes down to, whether or not somebody wants to wear a mask or go out to eat dinner or be with a group of people. So uh, it's been pretty successful. I know that it's been a year exactly, and that has been wearing on people. But I think as we come into the next month and maybe a month after that in these, uh, through the bridge period, the transition, and then once we get into phase five where there are no restrictions on functions and we're essentially back to normal, uh, that's, that term is used loosely now, but once we get back to normal the first part of May, I think people will feel better and they'll understand the sacrifice. It doesn't take away from the negative impacts that have happened on businesses and, and families and kids and all of that, uh, but it just uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, I guess, progress uh, away from that and back into uh, kind of normal activities and people realizing that the sacrifice was worthwhile. No doubt about it. And um, uh, I know a message or a question popped up, which I'll ask in a minute. But uh, if you do have a question, if you just uh, provide that through the Facebook link, or if you uh, forget to and want to send us information later, you can do it at Springfield at, fee I'm sorry, uh, feedback at springfield.il.us. Again, that's feedback at springfield.il.us. But the question that uh, someone asks is about that, if uh, they had the double dose, uh, do they still have to wear the mask if they've already received their vaccine? It's past the two weeks uh, when they're after that incubation period or whatever they're calling that now. Um, and you know, I'll let you go ahead and answer, but uh, in Springfield, we still have the mask mandate. So the answer would be yes. Uh, but uh, I think that's the CDC protocol that you still continue to wear the mask uh, because you don't know who's have the uh, vaccination. And aside from that, you still can spread the germ is my understanding if you, uh, you just might have it, but not to the great degree 
with the vaccine that you've been received. So you might not be as ill as you typically would, but you still could spread it. But uh, right. what's your understanding of that, Brad? Yeah, you're correct, Mayor. And uh, just to go back, the day, they just moments ago uh, released what the uh, total vaccination uh, number is. It's been administered here in Illinois, and it's just over 5 million. So uh, to your question or the question in the chat, you do have to receive the full vaccination, which is either the two doses of Moderna or Pfizer or the single dose of Johnson & Johnson and allow an incubation period after that. So it's still, it's not right when you get the shot or shots, the second one that you're in the clear, but a period of time after that. And the governor has announced that with the transition and as we go into the phases, that the mask mandate statewide will continue to be in place until lifted by the Centers for Disease Control. So the CDC still has the recommendation for wearing a mask and that will be the case until they change it in Illinois, according to what the governor has done. Now, Mayor, you have implemented a mask ordinance here. The city council has, I, I guess they adopted that as an ordinance um, in mm -hmm. Springfield. And so that will be in place, uh, you know, I assume to coincide with the state order and the CDC, but that will be up to you. However, the state order will remain in place until CDC changes their mind. So. Right. And, um... Actually, you know, of, uh, uh, what we should all remember is, uh, even though everybody gets vaccinated, um, I'm not saying it's the flu or like the flu. I'm saying it's going to uh, take that same progression where you're, uh, I could see us getting a COVID shot every year, just like a flu shot. And so we're still in that incubation period. Where we're trying to understand what, uh, how these shots, how long do they last? Is there a booster shot that's needed? But I could see actually next flu season where we might uh, recommend that people wear their mask. And the reason for that is it's proven this year, aside from COVID, that uh, flu is down this year. And that's largely due to the, um, you know, people keeping socially distanced and wearing the mask. So uh, we'll play it by ear, of course, but people should be, you know, um, you know, we're not out of the woods. Uh, how do we best live our lives going into the future, keeping businesses open as much as possible? So wearing the mask might be uh, become a, a regular type item uh, come the winter time. The best thing I like about it, though, it keeps your face warm when you're outside. So, but uh, don't be alarmed by that. But uh, we'll play it by ear. Not saying that it will be uh, mandatory, but uh, I could see it being recommended. Uh, but I, you know, others have done it around the world, and so that could be the new normal. But time will tell with regards to that. But the good news is we're moving past these phases. We still need to keep our guard up. We want to have, uh, you know, the open festivals like we once had downtown Springfield. Brad's located in downtown Springfield, uh, boarding my favorite block, the Y block. And, uh, yeah, we appreciate uh, their investment in downtown. It's a beautiful building that they really renovated um, with regards to that. The one thing, though, the good news we did receive is the American Rescue Plan. I wanted to touch on that. That's the federal government's um, support for municipalities were finally named in the rescue plan where they would receive funding to help offset the, uh, you know, the damage that the COVID has done to all municipalities, but also with the economic recovery and uh, moving that direction. Uh, but I should say before we get on that is, you know, thanks especially to Senator Duckworth and Senator Durbin for pushing that through because I think it only passed by one vote. Uh, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris had to uh, break the tie, but really is the leadership of Senator Durbin and Senator Duckworth that got us to that point. And we can't thank them enough because it will uh, really help Illinois and Springfield and all the cities uh, rebound faster economically. But Brad, if you'd uh, like to touch on the American Rescue Plan and what that means to you know uh, municipalities or whatever you'd like to share, that'd be great. Sure. And as you indicated, this was the second relief package around COVID, the first being a year ago that was actually signed into law on March 27th of 2020 by uh, President Trump, which provided some money through the Federal CARES Act to municipalities on a reimbursement basis, and it had to meet certain criteria. The state of Illinois was involved with distributing those dollars, and they placed additional restrictions on the funding, which really hampered local governments, in our opinion, as far as being able to effectively use those dollars. So 
the Illinois Municipal League, with help of uh, mayors like you and others, started working with our congressional delegation to make sure they understood where the problems were with the Federal CARES Act. And as they were developing the American Rescue Plan, we built into that solutions for the problems that we saw the first time. And in fact, we, we've been working with Congress uh, back in December and then in February and in March uh, to make sure that they got the legislative language right. And to your point, Senator Durbin was a significant leader in that. He was committed from the beginning to make sure the local governments got the resources they need and Senator Duckworth as well. Uh, and she uh, has followed up on that. In fact, we just had a call with her a couple of days ago with our board of directors uh, and hearing from her directly about that process. So the American Rescue Plan is going to be a little bit different in the funding process than the Federal CARES Act was, and that this is actually going to distribute money up front and cities will be able to use those resources on uh, different eligible expenses, not as a reimbursement like the last round was, you have to justify and use these dollars primarily for four different areas. One, the costs uh, that were affiliated with the public health emergency. Uh, that also includes negative economic impacts to households, to families, or businesses, nonprofits, and industries like travel and tourism and hospitality, which has really suffered in Springfield. Uh, then also the second area is essential workers and being able to provide for the salary and personnel costs for essential workers uh, during this pandemic. The third area is just general government services and lost revenue. City of Springfield lost revenues because of the decline in travel, tourism, and uh, just businesses being closed, sales tax, but all other things uh, related to the public health emergency. So that's an area where there will be some ability to use these dollars. And then the fourth area, which is broad and, and very new, which is designed to stimulate the economy and some activity, activity is investments in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. So for the city of Springfield, based on the metropolitan service area and the per capita distribution, Springfield will be getting about $34 million for through the American Rescue Plan for those four different areas to be able to invest back in the community and to offset lost revenues. Other communities in the area will also be receiving uh, funds. And it, it's important to note that uh, places like Rochester you know, will get maybe about $450,000. Uh, that's a lot of money. Um, Williamsville will get a, a little bit less than $200,000. Uh, see here, Sherman is gonna get about $600,000. So communities in the area will be receiving these dollars. And then the counties also receive funding directly as well. So those funds will be able to be put to use in two different allocations. The first one will be coming here in the next 60 to 90 days. And then the second tranche will be distributed a year later. And hopefully communities will put those dollars to good use and work will begin and the economy will recover and people will be able to benefit and make up for the lost time they had. So that's kind of a quick outline of the, of the bill. Now, there were a lot of things in the American Recovery Plan that don't address municipal functions around COVID. Uh, and I'm not gonna get into those. Those have been discussed more on the national level, uh, but they were included in the bill and uh, they will be a part of, of this overall. It's important to note too, that under the Federal CARES Act last year, municipalities only had until the end of the calendar year to spend those dollars. Now that's been extended a little bit this year, but these American Recovery Plan funds will be available through the end of 2024. So it really allows for an extended period to be able to stimulate the economy and to help people. Yeah, that's uh, really welcome news uh, with regards to that. And as you pointed out, the uh, municipalities you list like Sherman, uh, Chatham and Rochester, they will uh, be allocated through the state of Illinois, the city of Springfield's uh, larger. We receive community development block grant funds through housing and urban development. So it's, it, it's called the entitlement, entitlement city. And uh, so we'll receive those funds directly in two tranches. Uh, the first one, like you said, then 60, uh, 90 days of the president signing it. And then uh, uh, a year later, I think, is the second one. But we're uh, looking to hopefully leverage those dollars as much as possible because 
we're interested in really improving our infrastructure, you know, with regards to water. I think that's why they pointed that out or sewers or the broadband is with the pandemic, it showed the deficiencies municipalities have or cities have with regards to having broadband access for individuals in uh, particularly lower income areas. Um, and, uh, you know, with the working remotely or with schools, uh, remote learning, you have to have that broadband access. So that's one aspect. The other one with water, you know, uh, lead pipe replacement, things of that nature, you know, just water is an essential uh, component to living. And I think that's what they want to make sure is addressed. And God forbid we have to go through this again, but they want to make sure cities are better prepared next time if there is ever a next time. Right. And you mentioned the village of Chatham, and they're going to receive about $1.6 million. Uh, and to your point, it's absolutely right. This is about recovery from the effects that we've undergone in the last year, but also planning for the future so that broadband can be strengthened so that those resources are there for not just at home learning with schools, but all the at home working. As you know, mm -hmm. uh, you've had people that have been not at their office or not at work. And when you have a couple of uh, family members both fighting for bandwidth to be on Facebook Live or to have a Zoom meeting, uh, it really can be a stretch for folks. So this is about recovery, but also planning for the future with those infrastructure investments. Yeah, without a doubt, I can, again, I can't thank uh, Senator Duckworth and Durbin enough, Senator Durbin, because it's rare, very rare that a vice president has to cast the deciding vote. So that tells you how crucial those two votes were to make this happen. And really, this is an opportunity, even though we've been through a year that uh, you know, served like 10 years, uh, this is an opportunity to really springboard out of it. If we can leverage with other, you know, you mentioned Sangamon County, they'll receive a significant amount. If we can work together, like on bath, bike pathways, things of that nature, on infrastructure and really raise the level of quality of life in the area now's our opportunity to really do that uh, for us it's going to be within the inner city but also you know through the connectivity of uh, other resources working with the sanitary district or the park district or you know uh, Sangamon county and working with the private sector or public sector uh, moving that direction and it's just not those resources but that's the direct uh, uh, receipts that were received but there's also going to be assistance through businesses as well as housing initiatives uh, for the moratorium. So uh, when that list that people will finally hopefully be able to get back on their feet, but there's also going to be grant dollars available for those type entities to move in that positive direction. Yeah, there, there's a whole lot of pieces of this puzzle that are being put together and still have to be put together. So uh, to your point, there's a lot on housing, there's economic development, there's business assistance, there's the infrastructure, uh, repair and rebuilding, just a lot of different pieces that are going to have to be attended to. City of Springfield is very well situated to be able to address those items. I work with all the cities in, around the state and we see some that are better prepared than others. Springfield is definitely among the better prepared uh, because you have a good uh, system in place currently and your management structure allows for you to be able to address issues of concern like you raised. We think the American Rescue Plan although it has a very hefty price tag overall, the resources that are provided to municipalities, and counties, and states is really just a small piece of that. And that really is money that should have been provided a year ago in the first package. But we're very appreciative of the entire Illinois congressional delegation, as you noted, our two US senators for spearheading our perspective to make sure that the issues that we needed to see addressed were included and it's uh, very gratifying that they were able to get that done. And what we'll see then over the next year or two or three, as all of these projects unfold and communities grow and continue to prosper, I think we'll, we'll all be appreciative of that work. Well, thank you for that enlightenment on the American Rescue Plan. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on before we close is the uh, criminal justice reform bill that the state legislature passed. Um, if you would highlight some of the challenges or concerns, and uh, I, you know, I've been in constant conversation with uh, Chief Winslow. Uh, you know, I couldn't ask for a better chief. That's why I kept him here. And I think it's proven uh, uh, the reason why is what we're going through here locally. I mean, gun violence is, uh, you know, uh, escalating and that's just not in Springfield, it's around the country. 
And so there's greater concern with regards to that. Uh, there's the uncertainty, uh, but what we need to do first and foremost is make sure that the police can service as best as possible. And uh, Chief Winslow would tell you there's some items within the bill itself that uh, make sense. I think Springfield was above a lot of municipalities in uh, how we do policing and engagement. We were one of the first communities to have the body cameras, things of that nature, and that's in the bill now. Uh, but the, he'll say, you know, there's certain things that aren't uh, that uh, need to be further vetted. One is the zero cash bond. Uh, that's very concerning. And just the general support for law enforcement to make sure that uh, people you know, do respect the police, uh, do respect one another so we can have peaceful communities that we all want. So if you would uh, just uh, give an overview on that, what you've heard, I think that'd be helpful. Sure. Uh, that legislation was passed in January. It became Public Act 101-652. So that is the uh, criminal justice reform legislation. There were a number of items included in that that we did have issues with that we worked with the bill sponsor on, uh, both the bill sponsors, both in the House and the Senate, and they understood our point of view. Uh, issues like the mandatory use of body cameras. I think most departments, police departments, want to use body cameras. They just want to make sure that they can afford them and that the data can be stored and that that can be afforded, affordable too, because there's an ongoing expense to all of these issues. Uh, that was one key piece. There was also additional training requirements that were put into place uh, through the Illinois Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board, which we support. However, there's an expense to that too. So we're still working on that piece as an unfunded mandate to local governments. But uh, there are other provisions amending the criminal code that address uh, cash bail, the elimination of cash bail and the provisions on how judges can determine when bail is appropriate. There are also issues of addressing police misconduct or alleged misconduct and who can make complaints against a police officer or a public safety employee, uh, what the remedies are for that, where the Illinois Attorney General has authority to come in and seek some type of equitable relief or maybe civil penalties against the individual involved. Uh, you know, this was a, a massive piece of legislation, almost 750 pages long, and it dealt with a number of issues, those that we just talked about, uh, also dealt with issues with regard to suspension of license, driver's licenses in the Illinois Vehicle Code and items that you know, people don't necessarily think about, but like when somebody gets arrested, how and when can they communicate with somebody, either their family or their attorney or somebody like that outside? And what's the time, the, the requirement for somebody when they have to be charged? And, and so there are a lot of different pieces to the criminal justice reform legislation that became law in January. And we are committed to working on behalf of all municipalities because municipalities employ the largest number of police officers in the state basically in any state, because there are so many municipalities, they have the police officers that are gonna be impacted by this. Those officers, however, are serving their communities and they want to provide and protect for those communities. So there's a, a delicate balance there. Certainly some things needed to be addressed and some things are still unresolved in the legislation. We're working with the sponsors, as I indicated in the General Assembly on those matters. We've told them what our concerns are and and they're receptive to how we can address that going forward. None of these issues are necessarily immediate. So we have some time, there's some time built in to adjust to things like the body camera, the body worn camera mandate. So communities of various sizes will have time to adapt to that. So it's, it's a comprehensive and complicated piece of legislation that we are as, a state of, as, as the state of Illinois on the forefront of nationally but we're working with uh, all of the interested parties and individuals, employees and employers to make sure we can accommodate both the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. I will say that one thing that was taken out of the proposal before it passed was critical to us to remove, and that was the protection of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity protects public safety employees and officials uh, when they are in the course of their job doing something that they believe to be legal it provides them a level of protection if they get sued or go to court that the judge has to grant. Not automatic, the judge has to grant disqualified immunity. 
there was an effort to remove qualified immunity, disallow it, and that was taken out of this legislation. And we're thankful that they did take that out. There will be discussions ongoing about that, and there have been at the national level too. But that is something that if we are unable to maintain qualified immunity for public safety employees and officials, that will be a real issue in retaining and attracting police officers because of the unknown liability that could be out there for them. So uh, there were some, as I said, there were a lot of things in the bill. Uh, we were happy with some things, not happy with other things. We still have a lot of things to work on. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I'm glad you brought up the qualified immunity because it's really uh, the understanding of what uh, put yourself in the shoes of uh, the police, put yourselves in the shoes of uh, some of the people that are, um, you know, might be arrested or accused of uh, doing wrongdoing. And so that's what really needs to transpire. And once things open back up, we do have assimilation uh, equipment out at the academy. And I'd encourage anybody you know, uh, to go through that because you have split second decision making to uh, determine if a person is, you know, someone that, that's a threat or, you know, may not be a threat and you thought he was, but it really gives you a, a small perspective of what an officer goes through day in and day out to try to make those split second decisions uh, that keep us safe. The other thing is uh, with regards to, you know, the uh, Black Lives uh, Matter movement, with regards to that understanding what a black person goes through uh, on a daily, uh, you know, day to day, uh, you know, in their life. And what really struck me is uh, during a symposium, I've mentioned this several times where Archie Lawrence, who actually helped with the change of this form of government, he spoke to the rules that they have to teach their children. Uh, you know, when they get their driver's license, uh, when they get pulled over, it's not like a white person where you don't have to worry as much as they do with any sudden movements or anything. So they teach their children how to, you know, don't make any sudden movements, have your hands always on the steering wheel. And uh, it goes on from there. And then aside from that, uh, you know, during the pandemic with all the civil unrest, things of that nature, uh, there is a lady that they were interviewing on CNN and uh, her son, who was a minority, he left his backpack on the, at the restaurant where he worked. So she goes, run back and get it. So he runs back and get it, gets it. And she turns around, tells him to stop because it's the image of a black man running down the street. What that, that per, preconceived um, image it, it reflects. And that's what we, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what we have to change in our society is that true understanding and those perceptions of racism or, you know, those mental perceptions that we have to really uh, look at what's around us and really have a true understanding of uh, where we need to get to, to have a, you know, an equitable society. And I think that's the true essence of what was uh, the, what's trying to be the attempted here with the criminal justice reform bill. And it will take everybody working together to get to that point. Yes, absolutely. And just as you know, anybody that's alleged to, to have violated the law or committed the crime is, of course, innocent until proven guilty. But it's also important to remember that not everybody commits crimes mm -hmm. and not every police officer is a bad police officer. This mm -hmm. greater understanding to the perspective that you just highlighted with that instance, uh, the perspective of the alleged perpetrator, you know, or somebody that maybe is accused of a crime, also a, a victim, an alleged victim, but then also the public safety employee. All of those parties have to understand the perspective of the other and realize that in most cases, they're coming together under a bad circumstance. Mm -hmm. Most cases are not a positive, cheery, happy circumstance. And so everyone already is anxious or there is a, you know, something to overcome in the, in the discussion and dialogue and interaction. And I think that's what the intent of this legislation is, which is to provide for the health, safety, and welfare of the residents and to protect the public safety employees who are assigned with that job. So it's not meant to penalize the, the good cops, and it's not meant to penalize the good citizens. It's meant to properly adjudicate crimes when they occur and to enforce criminal justice, to do so fairly, and to make sure communities are more cohesive and that they can prosper and grow and really be a community. That's what you're trying to develop here across all the wards in Springfield. 
and across every community in the state. Yeah, that's uh, really what will uh, move us in the right direction is that community engagement. As I mentioned, when we started this discussion of gun violence and a lot of that can be resolved uh, through, you know, community co cooperation, uh, you know, working with the police as much as possible to keep everyone safe. But the body cameras, that's one uh, important piece of legislation, which we already had in place, but it has proven uh, helpful in two incidents. One was uh, um, against an officer and one was for protected the officer. So it does help in that aspect, give a better picture of what's happening in those particular situations. And then anybody that would like to uh, participate, actually the Springfield branch of the NAACP and the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, they're hosting a criminal justice reform uh, discussion tomorrow night, uh, town hall at the Southeast High School auditorium from six o'clock to eight o'clock. And I talked to Teresa Haley and she said, it's open to anybody, you know, it doesn't matter if you're for it or against it or in between, uh, it's an open discussion to uh, talk about it. And that's where we need to get to that understanding and respect of the direction we want our community to be at to keep everybody safe because uh, you hit the nail on the head, Brad, when you said uh, that's what it's all about is to, you know, keep our community safe regardless where we live, who we are, and that's what we need to strive for together. So I appreciate uh, your participating today. Uh, any closing remarks? I know it went pretty quick, but I really do appreciate you taking that time and uh, giving us the update on not only uh, where we are with the virus, but uh, all over our state with regards to the American Rescue Plan and the criminal justice reform. We'll have you back again, I'm sure. Okay, well, I appreciate the invitation and I'm always glad to participate. Uh, it's, it's nice to be in Springfield and our city government is functioning and trying to address the needs of residents. It's a tough task for mayors and aldermen and uh, village board members across the state. And just ask people to keep that in mind too. Uh, elected officials are trying to balance everything for their communities and they don't necessarily have all the right answers at the right time, but uh, people like you and others are trying every day to serve their communities. And we're thankful to be able to be a resource as the Illinois Municipal League. I'm glad to join you today. And uh, certainly I watch uh, your other uh, live uh, uh, events when I'm not on here. Uh, and so I look forward to those. And if it can ever be of assistance, of course, keep us in mind and let us know. So thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, on behalf of all the cities or mayors uh, throughout the state, we really appreciate your work and the Illinois Municipal League being our uh, chief advocate at the State House uh, because we can't be there as much as you are. And we really appreciate looking after our welfare. So thank you very much and thanks for participating. One quick item I forgot to mention at the top of the hour is uh, I'm uh, participating in a Bloomberg Harvard initiative. Uh, they selected 38 mayors from uh, around the country to participate in a pandemic uh, initiative where they kept us informed on a, a wide variety of issues, similar to what we've covered today uh, with regards to the uh, virus itself, uh, the economic recovery, uh, social impact, uh, criminal justice, all of it. And it was very helpful. One of the items that came from that is a Bloomberg Harvard data tracking initiative for schools. And so uh, the city of Springfield was selected uh, to be a participant in that with School District 186. And there's a dashboard that was created uh, from that Bloomberg Harvard initiative. And to access that, you can go onto our website at springfield.il.us. And uh, what it will show, it's again in the rotating banner, uh, school district 186, all the schools that will show their positivity rate uh, from the staff and the uh, student level, as well as the uh, quarantines that are happening. So people can get a greater reassurance of uh, that the decisions, the tough decisions that uh, Jennifer Gillard, superintendent and others have to make on a regular basis, they're doing it with the best information possible. And what we all wish to do is, uh, you know, support one another, respect one another, and understand that we're trying to do the right thing especially for our children. And so we appreciate the school board, um, you know, moving the direction for getting people back into the classes. That's where they need to be. And we're at that point where we're able to do that successfully. And we really thank uh, Bloomberg Harvard for helping create that dashboard. And I encourage anyone to go onto our website or go to school district 186 and take a look at it because that will not only help during this time frame, but future timeframes that built that infrastructure 
that will benefit uh, our students uh, as we move forward uh, during this pandemic and post pandemic. So as always, uh, hopefully you'll join us next Wednesday at noon uh, for the next Facebook Live. Until then, we always hope that let's make today better than yesterday and tomorrow better than today. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, Brad.